See, and we just started right on time. Okay, so to make sure everyone's in the right room, this is CSE 545 Software Security Fall 2018. Does anything about that seem wrong? Good, okay, just making sure. Um, so the uh, eventual instructor of this course will likely be uh, Dr. Fish Wang. This is a little introduction. This is Fish, you can say hi Fish. He'll say hi eventually very soon. Um, he's a very nice person and he's also incredibly intelligent. So to tell you a little bit about his background, so he did his undergraduate, or sorry, uh, actually I don't know where he did his undergraduate or anything, but he did his uh, PhD, I was getting my background, this is how many times I've introduced myself and not somebody else. Uh, so Fish did his PhD at UC Santa Barbara, and he is, it doesn't say it on here, um, he may have created these slides, uh, he is probably the best reverse engineer I've seen ever seen, and he may be the best on the planet, uh, and that's not actually really even an overstatement. Um, so what is reverse engineering? What is engineering? Building something. Mm. What is what? Yeah, it's building something. Building something, right? So you first design it, and then you, uh, so you have some requirements, you make a design of those requirements, you implement it, and then that gets compiled into some code that then gets executed by the CPU. So the reverse engineering process is going backwards. So starting from the binary, essentially working your way up to understand the logic of a program. So I've seen Fish do this. He also doesn't know I was gonna say this, so I don't know if he's watching. Uh, that's what happens uh, when you just have somebody else teach stuff. Um, I've seen him, he just scrolls through binary code and translates it to C in his head on the fly. <laughs> um, because you can ask about this, he's been doing this since he was eight years old and he got into like understanding how Windows works and Windows, as you all know, is closed source, you don't have access to source code, so you have to reverse engineer it to understand what's going on. Um, so as part of that, he, um, so he finished his PhD, I believe this summer is when he defended. Uh, he's just starting as a brand new professor here at ASU. He has, his research is focused really on system security and uh, which actually kind of downplays it a little bit. It's really trying to develop tools to automatically find vulnerabilities in binary applications. So he was um, one of the leaders of the, so he's a core member of the hacking group Shellfish, which is mainly UCSD's um, hacking team, which is one of the longest running teams who've competed at kind of the Olympics of hacking, DEF CON CTF, which I'll mention in a second. Um, but Fish was part of a team that created a, a uh, what they call it, autonomous cyber reasoning system. So that's basically the idea of DARPA, do, do people know what DARPA is? So they're the uh, government funding agency in the United States that kind of funds crazy things. So one of their grand challenges was back in, I think, the early 2000s, was can you build a car that can autonom autonomously go from point A to point B, right? Which now, it kind of seems silly because we have autonomous self-driving cars <coughs> driving around Tempe. But back then, that was kind of a crazy idea. Can you even do it? And so back in, I think it was 2013, 2014, DARPA had an idea to do a cyber grand challenge, where the idea was there's these human hackers that are incredibly good at analyzing a binary, finding vulnerabilities, writing exploits. Why can't we have machines do it? And so DARPA put on this competition to, for teams to create an automated cyber reasoning system. So I didn't pull up any pictures here, but I'm sure Fish will share super cool pictures, every team essentially had like a mini supercomputer, and then when the contest started, they cut all the cords, so there was no outside communication. Um, and Shellfish actually came in third place overall, and if you talk to them, one of the cool things was they were actually first place on attacking, they had the cyber reasoning system that found the most vulnerabilities and exploited the most things, uh, but their defensive strategy was very poor, and there was a whole game theory aspect of patching your binaries to make them more difficult, but that would cause you to lose points, and they were kind of patching indiscriminately, so they actually, I believe they re-ran the results, and if they had not patched at all and not done any defense, they would have ended up first. <laughs> um, so, Fish is awesome, and one of the really cool things that came out of that project is this tool, this open source tool called Anger, which if you go look, is a uh, essentially a binary, an open source binary analysis framework. So this is all written in Python. It can do all kinds of crazy stuff, symbolic execution. It is very, very cool. Um, and it's actually used in a lot of other companies and a lot of other things. 
He's published a lot of papers at some of the top tier security venues. Uh, so yes, Fish is awesome. I'm super excited that you guys will get to uh, take a class from him. All right, so I'm Adam Dupe. I actually don't have anything on myself uh, because I can talk about myself. So I have, let's see, I did, I know where I did my undergrad. So I actually did undergrad, masters, um, and a PhD all from UC Santa Barbara. So I did their equivalent of a four plus one program. Got my master's degree and I said, I'm done with academia. I'm never coming back here. And I went to Microsoft, worked a full-time job as a software developer, and then decided like, ah, I really like doing research. So I went back to UCSB for my PhD. Uh, I was there for four years, graduated in 2014, got a job here at ASU, and I've been here ever since. So my kind of research actually intersects a lot with FISH in the sense that my PhD was on automated ways to find vulnerabilities in a web application, either through source code analysis or by just black box interaction. Um, and so we have a lot of overlap. We're essentially at heart hackers. We love <coughs> breaking things. We love finding vulnerabilities. We love writing exploits. Um, and the really cool thing of turning that into research is thinking about how can you automate that and how can you actually turn that into an automated system so that that way you don't have to hire a hacker who costs, you know, $500,000 a year for a pen test one time a year, you can actually automate that process. Let's see, any questions on me, my background? I've also taught this class, I think, three or four times. So, But I'm not teaching this class. Cool, okay. So a little bit of background on what, uh, we'll give you a little more insight into Fish and I's mindset. Um, so, Fish played as part of Shellfish in this, so as you will come to learn in this class, this class is going to be a lot of hands-on security learning, and you will do a lot of capture the flag contests in class. Uh, for those that don't know, at a high level, essentially a capture the flag uh, depends on the exact type, but essentially um, the organizers will write custom binaries or custom applications that contain one or more intended vulnerabilities. So the idea is every team gets that. So you have to study your application, identify the vulnerabilities, write an exploit, fire the exploit at every other team to steal some <coughs> bit of data called a flag, which you submit to the organizers for points. And this has actually turned into a big thing where there's CTFs essentially every weekend. You can go to ctftime.org and see that there's constantly these CTFs happening. Um, and so the kind of the uh, world championship of these CTFs is DEF CON CTF. So DEF CON is a conference, like this underground hacking conference that happens every summer in Las Vegas. Uh, and I say underground because to get in, they don't, like it's, uh, so it's a, I think a four day conference, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And to get in, it's only like $260, which compared to any type of regular hacking conference, which can be in the thousands of dollars. Um, so it's pretty cheap and they only accept cash. So they're trying to keep things as anonymous as possible. There's a culture of not taking pictures of people unless you have their permission. So um, that kind of stuff is discouraged. So at DEF, CON CT, at, at DEF CON, one of the big events is this capture the flag event. And so from there, it's kind of an invite only thing where there'll be some kind of qualification event. So this year, Qualls was in May. The top 24 teams from that qualification event were invited to play in DEF CON CTF. This is all in person in Vegas. One of the, I think the Italian team flew in, I think 33 team members from Italy to play uh, the CTF. Um, and so the cool thing was that Fish was playing the CTF and I was actually part of the group organizing it with the Order of the Overflow. So we were creating all these challenges and making sure that the game was fun and could be played by everyone. So I want to share a little bit of this. So this is kind of what the room looked like. So we're the organizers here in the center, kind of running everything. And then there were 24, you can think of like squares of tables all around us with all the teams. And then there were 24 ethernet cables that were shrung and taped along the ground to go to each of these teams, which is a huge pain, uh, which we had to do ourselves. Um, luckily we had some great volunteers to help us. And I actually don't know if you can see him. I tried to find a picture of Fish and he said there's no pic he took no pictures of himself during the CTF. Um, so while we were um, kind of uh, organizing the game, they were playing, and I should mention that 
There's also this, so most of the organizing team were all ex-Shellfish players, so I used to play with Shellfish when I was at UCSB. Uh, ex-Shellfish, 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 ex-Shellfish. Uh, that guy in the back that you can barely see actually uh, won DEF CON CTF one year, I think in 2008 to 2006. Um, so at the closing ceremony, so this was, I should mention the, the CTF goes for a total of basically 48 hours. It was 10 hours on Friday, and then we shut the network down, 10 hours on Saturday, and then we shut everything down, and then four hours on Sunday. Um, and then, but the teams, of course, would still work on challenges and stuff during the night. And while we would be busily, like, crazily fixing infrastructure also during the night. Um, so it was a cool cat and mouse game. This is us at the award ceremony. If you see a bunch of zombies in this picture, um, it is because I actually did the math a while ago, which is there's sometimes there's math you shouldn't do, right? Like, I did the math to figure out how long I slept from Thursday morning to this time on Sunday. It was about 6 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, and the total was, like, 10 hours. Just because Thursday night, we were all coming together, trying to get things to work. We pulled an all-nighter. <coughs> Friday night, we had to completely rewrite our patching system because it wasn't working. So I got three hours of sleep from that. And then the next night, I was like, I, I'm going to die if I don't sleep. <laughs> so I slept for like six hours. Um, so yeah, at this point, we're all kind of a little bit out of it uh, because everybody, it, took, it takes a lot of work to put on something like this. And you got to imagine when you invite 24 of the top hacking teams in the world into your network, uh, weird stuff happens. Uh, so, oh, I didn't put the theme, team. Uh, so the good news from our perspective is that Shellfish did not win uh, because that would have raised some flags in the community because here these ex-Shellfish players are organizing and then Shellfish wins. So we're actually very happy about that. Um, so anyways, that I think frames kind of this course a little bit as I'll talk about in a second. So does anybody have any questions on that? I'm happy to talk more. Yeah. This is only related to DEF CON, but why did you release one of the challenges like five minutes before you uh, the closing time? We just didn't sleep that night. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how it goes. So, uh, yeah, you it, organizing it is a, a tough mix of when you release things, right? So, we know teams are going to do stuff overnight, anyways, right? So you kind of have a rough plan of when you're going to release things, and so if there's something that we know teams can work on over the night that they don't need the system for, that's something we may or may not do. Yeah, it's kind of the nice thing and the curse of organizing this. Your part's a referee, because kind of whatever you say goes. It turns out some of the teams were making too many requests, so we started unplugging their cables from the network. And then when they could complain, we'd say, well, you're making you know over 60 requests per second to this service that we've said is very slow, so stop doing that, and we'll plug you back in. Um, at the same time, you're kind of building like an obstacle course or building a lot of puzzles, so uh, I don't know, maintaining that balance is tricky. And then you make decisions during this competition on no sleep, so that also adds to the fun. <coughs> cool, oh, okay, and I should mention, I don't have a picture here. Uh, the winning team was a team, DEFCOR Root, which is a group from South Korea and Georgia Tech. Uh, the really cool thing about this is the winning team gets eight of these black badges, these DEF CON badges, so you can see uh, these badges here, like the badges we were wearing to get access to the, to the conference itself, a black badge gets you access to the conference for life, so for free. Uh, so it's you know super highly sought after. These are really prestigious kind of black badges. Um, and so that's kind of, actually there's no like monetary prize <laughs> in this contest. It's just bragging rights and black badges. Cool, okay. So now I wanna talk about security why hopefully we're, we are all here in this room. So has anyone ever run into an error or bug or failure? Yes, has anybody not? <laughs> has anyone not, has anyone written, has anyone never written code with a bug or error or some kind of failure? Yeah, it's happened to me one time, I think it was I mean, very late in my programming career where I wrote like a, just a 50 line Python script. I ran it and it worked. <laughs> and I was very worried. <laughs> triple, triple check those results because nothing should work on the first try, right? So, um, so software basically inherently has, you know, 
um, errors, bugs, and failures. So what are the, some of the kinds of things that you've seen in terms of I don't know, errors, bugs, failures? Yeah. Seg faulted kill. Seg faulted. So seg fault the program. So what does it mean when a program seg faults? Try to reach read to write not in the, uh, against what's permitted. Yeah, so it reads or writes some memory that it wasn't permitted to by the operating system, or executes too. Anybody else ever run into any bugs? Or a lot of null pointers. Null pointers? Yeah, so trying to dereference. It's kind of a similar thing where you're trying to reference or dereference and trying to get memory that's located at address <laughs> zero, which does not exist, which is a null pointer. Yeah. Stack corruption. Stack corruption. What does that mean? Buffer overflow. Yeah, so there's a couple different ways. You could do a, um, basically a stack, uh, what's that called, a stack? Is stack it an overflow? When you, yeah. when you hit do a recursive function too much and you use up all the stack space and you run out of stack space and the program blows up and crashes. You could accidentally overwrite a buffer on the stack, which as we'll, you'll eventually see in this class, clobbers really important um, memory that's located on the stack, which causes the whole thing to blow up. What else? exceptions. What was that? Not a number. Not a number. Ooh, those are super fun. Nobody's mentioned my favorite Python exception. Unicode decode errors or mixing of Unicode of bytes and uh, strings. Yeah, that's been that was super fun. Um, and they come in all kinds of forms. So has anybody seen this, or is this so old that nobody's ever seen that? Blue screen with that. Blue screen. See the one with the smiley on. Yeah, it's like a one. This one? Yeah. <laughs> Which one's friendlier? <laughs> both, both are evil. Yeah, you don't want to see. So what does this mean, and how is that different from what we were just talking about? This is a kernel panic. A this is a kernel panic. What does that mean? The operating system an error. Yeah, the operating system had an error, which means what for you? <laughs> New image. Can we change the mother? Yeah, it means something really bad went wrong, right? That means so your operating system is basically this layer, right, that's talking more or less directly to the hardware, and then your applications are running on that, talking to the operating system to do stuff for it. So when your operating system crashes, basically everything goes haywire, and it is definitely not good. Um, yeah, and it could be a hardware failure. It could be some software thing. It could even be a... Um, have you all heard the story of uh, this supercomputer built by, I wouldn't say a government agency because I don't remember which one. So this was told to me by a, by a computer architecture professor. He said that the, I want to say the army, but I don't remember which branch. So somebody commissioned these two supercomputers that were built. One was up in like, let's say like Colorado, Denver area, and one was on one of the coasts, I don't know, let's say Santa Barbara for ease of use, although I know that's wrong for sure. Um, and one of the systems had three times the error rate as the other system. So what do you do? So you're in that situation. That's clearly not okay, right? So what's probably a likely cause? A bug. A bug in the software. So you double check the software, 100% identical. Particles coming from the sun. Let's wait to get there. <laughs> Who jumps to particles? Nobody jumps there first. <laughs> A network, so I think this is pre-network, so we'll, we'll, so we'll say all the data, all the, the code was verified, the data was verified, it's all local, no networks. Hardware issue. Hardware issue, right? You think something is broken with the hardware. So they replaced every piece of hardware and tested every piece of hardware in the other system. Eventually what it turned out is because the system with the error rate was at a higher elevation, it had more, I believe it's gamma particles or something, I'm not a physicist, so don't quote me on that, but particles from the sun that would flip a bit randomly <coughs> on the computer and causing it to crash. And just because it was at the higher elevation, there were more particles that would make it there than would make it to the lower elevation. And so they put lead shielding above both of them and the error rates dropped to identical, which is absolutely insane to me. And everything runs on computers. <laughs> Just think about that. Um, so yeah, you could maybe you got unlucky. Maybe it wasn't your lucky day. Some. And the crazy thing is, you think about all the memory in your system, you know, if you choose one bit at random in there and flip it, it's probably not gonna do anything, but you choose the wrong bit and everything crashes and you can get one of these blue screens of death. Or the newer, handier, where it says your PC ran into a problem and needs to restart, which is actually a much more useful. I have no idea what this would tell you, this QR code. Um, 
scan it. Scan it? I'm not going to scan it, but you can scan it. Uh, so yeah, so kind of interesting thing here is reflecting. So you can actually see that one of the problems is if your computer just, I mean, if your operating system just straight bites the dust and can't do anything, all I can do is show you this screen. How does Microsoft know what to fix? Because they have no information about what went wrong and they can't debug it. So now they actually have a cool thing where they're going to collect information about the system to upload to them so they can actually figure out why it crashed so they can prevent it in the future, uh, which I think is pretty cool. What kind of secrets are they uploading when they do that? That is a good question. Um, that's an entire line of research of what other information about your computer. It's kind of a trust thing in some sense, right? Do you trust that they are not going to use that information? But at the end of the day, I, I don't know. Personally, I'd rather have my machine not crash in the future. <laughs> um, so it's kind of one of these, uh, it's, it's good for everyone if everyone does it, but it's incentives for you to not do it. I usually get these when I have crappy drivers. Yeah, it's drivers, so current, you know, all of your, Every, anytime has anybody gone to some ran, like plugged in some random device that doesn't work, you go to the website, download the drivers, right? You know that driver is running in the kernel. As part of essentially as part of the kernel is all the permissions of the kernel, so if the driver crashes, the entire OS usually crashes. Um, so yeah, Microsoft has actually done a lot of work in making those drivers better, more safe, uh, safer, I guess, but it's difficult still. But yes, that is oftentimes the problem. Uh, but not to pick on Microsoft, of course. I'm a Windows person, and I, I mean, I, I'm a Mac person, and I've definitely seen this Mac error message. Uh, you need to restart your computer. It's kind of nice. It gives it to you in multiple languages, so it's clearly not using your language de like detection that you're using, um, and then telling you just to reboot. And not to think that all of these only um, Windows and Macs kernel uh, panic and crash. You can even get this on Linux as well, and a way less useful error message. <laughs> um, and I've definitely seen this. Uh, there was a time when I was, I think this was 2013, 2014, when I was first using, I was trying to like build my own little mini cloud out of random like systems that we had laying around in our lab. Um, and so I was running a super early version of Docker on them, and just creating containers, killing them, creating containers, killing them. And over time, you just get crazy like kernel lockups and CPU, whatever. Man, that was super. Um, it actually made me negative on Docker for the next like four years. <laughs> I've only just started using it and accepting that it's mildly stable that I can actually use it. <laughs> cool. So, okay. So how would you kind of so? Something that, so we could say errors, bugs, failures, something that doesn't work as expected, but, but where do, I mean, where do they actually come from? The program. The program? Yeah, so the programmer oftentimes in what sense? So they like deliberately sit there and write like, <laughs> if <laughs> Adam presses this key, then the computer should hard crash? It's just uh, either a misunderstanding of the system that they're programming or uh, a failure to anticipate certain issues with the architecture. Right, so one thing to think about is the code is the code, right? Mm -hmm. Right, we know this, you're all at the, this is a master's, you know, a, a graduate level course. The CPU only does exactly what you tell it to do and nothing more, right? It doesn't magically think to like, oh, I should go fetch this other data or I should go execute this other command, right? Um, it's doing exactly what you tell it to do, so if you tell it to do something wrong that it doesn't know how to handle, that can cause a bug or some failure. Um, so something that we've talked about, so thinking kind of really in terms of like if it's not working as expected, a couple ways to think about this are in terms of behavior, right? So the behavior of the program, so we'd expect that a program, if we give it arbitrary input, would not crash. Is that a valid? More or less, do we agree with that? What if I give a program a terabyte of data? Yeah. Should work. Should work, but maybe. It depends on my requirements, right? I mean, the program, if I'm going to create an in-memory index of every word in that terabyte of data, there's probably no way I could do that on a normal system. So I need to understand the requirements to understand what it should, like what is correct behavior. So. Even something as simple as that, like does the program behave correctly, can be kind of tricky to understand. Um, 
where incorrect execution results. What's an example of that? So we've talked about crashes. We've actually focused a lot on crashes, which seem to be a predominant theme. I've taught, anyone taken 340? I've, taken, I've taught 340, so I've seen, I think I've seen every possible crash that a program can, can have, a C program. Um, that's actually one of the cool things I've been teaching that class for a while, is when you see something new that you haven't seen before, and you're like, how did you get it to do this? This is <laughs> impossible. I've never seen this before. Out of like 300 students, you're the first. Um, so what do we mean by incorrect execution results? like an integer overflow or underflow? Yeah, so an integer overflow or underflow, right? So whether, so maybe they're doing some incorrect calculation, so instead of, I mean, let's say have a super simple example, let's say the integers are capped at like 99 because you have weird, or let's use a byte, so it's capped at a byte, so the largest value is what of a byte? 255, yeah, for an unsigned integer. So if you're counting up how many people made a request to your web page using a byte, as soon as it gets to 255, when you add one, it now becomes zero, right? Which may not be what you want. What are some other examples? So that's kind of one that takes advantage of essentially how computers represent numbers versus how programmers and we think about numbers. So did you do an integer division? Say that again? Integer division also? Ooh, integer division. You want to elaborate a little bit? Like when you expect a result float, but you divide integers. Yeah, so that's a classic uh, Python 2 mistake, which I definitely have ran into many a times, where you're dividing two numbers, you expect the answer to be a float, but your language runtime actually truncates the float and keeps it as an int. Uh, that, can be, that can lead to errors, especially if you're doing that in a loop over some calculation, and then that error kind of accumulates, and at the end you get this horrible garbage result that means nothing to your input numbers and to what you wanted to calculate. Any other examples? Floating point equality checking. Ooh, equality checking on floating point. Yeah, that can get super weird. That's um, evil. Well, that's what? Evil. Evil. I like it. Yeah. I was reading a, a blog post about this person who was trying to fix a bug in a game. Mm -hmm. you, if you open the game after the system's on for a period of days, which we didn't used to do, right? Back in the early mm -hmm. 2000s, you used to turn off the computer and turn yeah. it on every day. Every, every night, you turn yeah. off your computer but every this night. Game would performance counter and when the number got so big it cast it to a float and lost all its precision so the time steps were all off. <laughs> that's crazy and that's yeah that's a funny super funny bug and that's yeah, that actually upset me when I went to the Apple store I think it was like three or four months ago and I was like this phone is slow like I don't understand he's like we should be turning it off once a day I'm like no I should not <laughs> I refuse to do that you should make a phone that doesn't need to do that but yes. it's 2018 like that all right, cool. So what about backdoor? So what would, what, how would you define a backdoor in terms of behavior? Who hasn't said anything today? I can call on people. I'm not going to be here long, so I don't need to make answers, I guess. So like an application has an admin privilege, and mm -hmm. a programmer has given some specific in instructions that only administrators can access. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a backdoor. Ooh, but if it's, well, Okay, but if it's if it's only functionality that an admin should access and admins are only allowed can only access it, how's that a backdoor? Because wouldn't that be functionality? Yeah. Right. If the design says there should be this admin section where there admins no, can do no such specification, like there should be no such admin, but still there is a super access. Perfect. Yeah. So one example to go back to the other one is let's say you have this admin page, like on anyone ever access their router, yes. their home router, the Wi-Fi. <coughs> yeah. What do you usually put in when you first boot it up? Admin, 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 admin or admin one, two, three, or you find the exact name, right? So there's hard-coded passwords there for your username and password. So this is, you would think of this if you didn't want that in your admin, if you had an admin page and it said only admin should be able to access it, but there's, an user, there's a user account of admin admin by default in the system, that you can definitely think of that as a backdoor. Um, and actually, Fish can tell you, he's done some work on automatically analyzing firmware samples of binaries to identify these kind of hard-coded backdoors and, and uh, basically hard-coded authentication methods in uh, these things, which is very cool. Um, cool, so yeah, so backdoors definitely, I think we can argue are bad, right? So it's 
functionality that somebody's injected into a program that makes it do something it definitely shouldn't be doing. Um, what about so what, what about performance? Why is performance important? Do we care about performance? Yes. Yes, you should. Yes. <laughs> do people really? I don't know. Why do you care about performance? So imagine now, put your mind, you're a software engineer, you're building a product for a company. Why do you care about performance? Yeah, but it's like the that. Sorry, users yeah. will see and interact with. They don't, they don't really know the programming. Right, so. Now they interact. Exactly. So, fundamentally, at the end of the day, what are you building a program for? User. Some, yeah, some user, somebody to actually do something. Right? And if they can't, if it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing in the time that it should be doing it, then why did you spend all that time and effort and money building that thing? Right? So, you can build the best, most complicated algorithm possible, but if it takes multiple months to run, let's say, oh, this is a good example. So let's say you are incredibly smart, which all of you are, and you've decided I'm going to build a system that's going to predict the stock market prices of the next day. So it's going to use all the historical data, you're going to use tweets, you're going to use blog posts, you're going to use everything available to predict stock prices. The catch is it takes a week to run. <laughs> right? At that point, it's not even worth it to do it because by the time you get the results, they're so out of date that it's useless. So yeah, so this is, you can also think of these and you should be thinking of these in terms of bugs and errors and failures. Um, anything else? Do you want to add something? Yeah. Cool. So, so this is what we think of, okay, something that doesn't work as expected, but then as we've been kind of alluding to, there's this idea of, okay, what was expected? Right, so in terms of what should happen. Um, and this is kind of things we've just talked about. Of It doesn't work expected by the programmer. So the programmers, there's some unexpected behavior like we talked about with um, maybe dividing two numbers and getting an integer instead of a float. Right, that'd be something that the programmer didn't intend. Um, interest, so some interesting things are, you know, third party manufacturers or collaborators, somebody may buy your software and not know that it does something that they don't want it to do. So who would who would care about stuff like that? End users. End users. So end users may uh, may not want. So we actually just had an example earlier of the crash system on Windows automatically uploading your crash data to them after a, a hard failure. Some people may not want that. They may see that as unwanted behavior. So what about um, do you ever think about, well, places. so does, so do companies write all their own software that runs on their own systems? No. no. Why not? Because they can do it's cloud computing. Software reuse. Yeah, software reuse, it's cheaper to just pay for somebody else's stuff. It would take a long time to get something usable. What about like things like the military? Well, outside software. Yeah, they buy outside software. Right? They oftentimes have to because it's way too expensive to build their own, right? And so you think about somebody like that, do they care what things and behaviors are running in the systems that they're running? Ever so slightly. Ever so slightly. How about they're terrified about it and they would really want ways to limit some of that functionality or to rip out even parts of that functionality while still having the main core still run? Cool. Okay, so yeah, um, so we talked about it a little bit. Why do errors and bugs and failures exist? Why do I still have a job as a security person? People make mistakes. People make mistakes? Yeah. What was that? Unaccounted for, like, um, like unaccounted for errors that occur because of things you wouldn't expect. Yeah, so there's a lot of, I mean, there's a ton of the different reasons, right? I think fundamentally when you boil it down for me, it's humans. Yeah, right? We're humans. We write software. Um, it's, I don't think we'll talk about it in this class, but it turns out everybody know the halting problem. Halting problem essentially at a rough high level means uh, you can't prove that for any arbitrary, I think is it any, you can't create a system that for any arbitrary program P will say whether it crashes or doesn't crash on any given input. Um, and it turns out that writing a program that says is, is there a 
find all the bugs in this program is the same problem as the halting problem. So we can't solve the halting problem. We can't make an automated tool that will find all of the bugs in a program that we care about. Um, so, which is good news for security people. It means there's always going to be bugs. And as we'll see, I mean, as you see, when you think about all of these systems that you're using, right? Uh, security, like security errors, bugs, failures, they come at different layers. And they come usually at the interaction between different layers. So not just, so, um, yeah, exactly. So, so fundamentally, right, so errors are eventually, I mean, humans, I guess, were the root of all evil in terms of software bugs. Uh, if it wasn't for us, I guess there'd be no computers, but there'd also be no computer bugs. Um, and so maybe some, like we said, programming mistakes or programming misconceptions, maybe the programmer thinks they're doing things correctly, but because of the exact semantics of that language runtime, maybe on that particular operating system, it's going to behave differently than they expect. Um, you can even get into cases, and this talks about jumping to uh, cosmic rays as the result of your bug. So when, you, when your program's not working right, what do you blame first? Your code, you. You should blame you. <laughs> Anybody said differently has far too great of an ego of their own code. You should look internally, look in the mirror, look at your code. There's probably a bug there. One time out of a thousand, it will be a compiler of the compiler actually having a bug. And of probably, I don't know, you know one out of a thousand of those times, it'll be some hardware thing. If you find a hardware thing, that's crazy. Um, but again, right, if the compiler has a bug, well, Humans wrote that compiler, right? And so they, there's a bug in there that causes your program to have a bug. But now you can see, start to see the complexity that we're dealing with, right? So you would have to code your program with no bugs, and you have to use a compiler that doesn't have any bugs. And, and so the core idea here is that, um, so you have errors, programmers make errors, which causes a bug in a program. So you can think of like a, I think of bugs and vulnerabilities as kind of latent. They're, they're sitting there in the program. Maybe it's some code path that never gets executed, but it's still there. And then when you trigger that bug, <coughs> bug when you trigger that bug or you execute it, then that actually causes that failure, right? So that's when, if it's in the kernel, we'll see the blue screen of death because we crashed the kernel. If it's uh, in an application, we'll get a seg fault. If it's a vulnerability that we've properly exploited, then maybe we get total control of that program and get it to do whatever we want to do, um, which is inherently not uh, crashing. Okay, cool. So, and, and this is the way of kind of thinking about these things. So this is why kind of um, some of the best security people are good developers themselves or have developer experience because they understand the developer's mindset when they're writing a code. So when they're analyzing it for vulnerabilities, they can try to identify, oh, this is where likely somebody made a mistake, like the divide by, like the division with integers, right? You say, ah, that's a common problem in Python code. I should check every division instance to see if this could potentially lead to a vulnerability. Um, so are all bugs security bugs? What's the difference? <coughs> You know it when you see it. Security bugs compromise the Security bugs say a lot? Compromise the user data. Yeah, so security bugs can compromise the user data. So let's say if there's a bug that allows an unauthorized user to compromise user data, then that would definitely be a bug. I, a security bug. I agree. Yeah. Bugs that could be leveraged to do something that the programmer does not want to happen. Right. Okay. So bugs that allow. Say it again. Uh, a user to do something that the programmer specifically does not want. Right. Okay. So a bug that allows the programmer uh, allows someone that forces the program to do something that the programmer didn't expect. So kind of this idea of unintended behavior. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's nebulous in a sense, and I think that's uh, getting to a good definition. I like to think of it as uh, a bug is a mistake in a code, right? A bug could lead to all the things that we talked about, of uh, crashes, incorrect execution results, backdoors. 
Um, but it may not matter, right? If, if, I don't know, if you have a payroll bug that allows somebody to change their salary and get paid a million dollars, that would be a huge problem. Um, if it's a, let's say, I don't know, what would be a weird bug? A bug that um, adds an extra letter to somebody's name in some system. It's like, ah, oh, that's weird, but it's not necessarily, it's not gonna bring down, it's not a, a core security vulnerability. Um, so I think of it as, it really is program dependent. So it depends on what that bug allows, a pro allows an attacker to do. So for instance, if it allows them to compromise user data, like we talked about, then that would clearly be a problem. Um, and the way I like to, to think about this is it means it's not just the buggy behavior itself, right? So if I told you I have the ability on a certain website to edit, the, edit any page on that site, is that a security bug? Yes. yes. Depends on the site. Why does it depend on the site? Do you own the site? <laughs> exactly. I may own the site. What about Wikipedia? Right? I don't even need a guest account. I can go and edit any page on Wikipedia. That's clearly not a security vulnerability. But the same behavior on CNN.com would clearly be a security vulnerability. Right? So that's why context is incredibly important in thinking about what is the application's intended behavior. Right? So you can think of it like a set. Right? If you just think of abstract set, what is this program supposed to do? which you may have to reverse engineer by interacting with it. And then can I get the program to do something it wasn't supposed to do? And then that's a security vulnerability. So this is actually something that comes up a lot when people report security vulnerabilities for a bug bounty program. It, they'll write up this whole report like, I can do this. And, oh, here's a good example. So one time I taught, um, I may not even been this class. I think it was 591, when I, my very first class I taught here. I told uh, the class, Here's a hacking challenge, it's a web hacking challenge. I gave them a, um, a shell on the system, like a user account that they could log into, so that they, because that's what you needed to do some levels. And I said, if anyone can get root on this system, you'll get an A on the assignment, you'll get extra credit. Uh, I probably didn't specify enough that a root, so the admin account on Windows, like the super user account, is the root account on Linux, and so I meant if you can elevate your privileges from a normal user to the root user, that would be a huge security vulnerability, and so I'd reward them appropriately. And a student very quickly after the class emailed me a screenshot of them doing ls space slash, saying like, I can, I can get the root, the root of the file system. Right? Which, you know, if you don't understand and you think you've, you've gotten extra credit, then you're going to try for that extra credit. So I had to explain, and part of that was on me and explaining, but you know, it's understanding. So the application clearly, you, it was intended that you could poke around the file system and look at the root files of, of the file system. Um, so that was kind of the intended behavior versus the unintended behavior. Cool, okay, so for software security, so here now we think about bugs. So you think about the universe of all possible you know, bugs in a program. Only some subset of those will actually be security bugs. And they're for the same reason that we basically, and it kind of flows from exactly what we just talked about. So security errors, they're always made by a human. There's some human that makes some mistake. Um, it's a security bug. It's exploited, which generates a uh, failure. And as a result, and this is the key, right, is what we talked about, the security policy of the system is violated. So, and again, that depends on the system, right? The security policy of Wikipedia does not say nobody can edit web pages of Wikipedia. It actually explicitly is the opposite, right? One of the things with Wikipedia, though, is anyone can edit a web page, but there needs to be a history of all the changes and who made that. So if you were able to edit a Wikipedia page and erase that history, then that would be a cool security bug. So you see how it's, pretty nuanced depending on the site that you're talking about, right? If you came to Wikipedia and were like, I can edit your pages, they'd say, go away, that's crazy. But if you say, I can edit your pages and no log will show up in the history and I can change it without any logs, that's something they would be really interested in. Questions on this? Security, you gotta lay the groundwork, right? Because you're gonna be, um, gonna train you to be little hackers. Well, not little, but you know. Mm -hmm. 
grown, I hope you're all adults. Uh, if you're not, that's still cool. Um, <laughs> I should probably just stop talking at this point. But uh, we're going to train you to be security professionals, so you need to understand what things are actually bugs and, <coughs> and what things are security bugs. Cool. So, <coughs> Okay, so when we think, how long does this course go till? 5.50. 5.50? a half hour. Ooh, that's fun. Okay, um, so when we think about kind of broadly, when we think about security, we typically think about three things that, of security properties that we want to guarantee about a system. So we talked about one thing with regards to photo or user data. The only authorized users should be able to access their data. So how would you kind of describe that? What would, I mean? Privacy. Privacy? Yeah, so privacy, or the other way to think about it is in terms of confidentiality. So you want to keep data confidential to only those people that should have it, right? What are some other properties? Is that the only security property that we'd ever want? Integrity. What was that? Integrity of the data. Integrity of the data. So what does integrity of the data mean? Yeah, right? And that's actually not the same thing as confidentiality, right? So if I can, let's say, um, edit your bank account so that you now have zero dollars instead of what you had it before, maybe, I guess for some, that would be good, but uh, for most, <laughs> that'd be bad. And they don't even need to know what your previous balance was, and they don't care, right? All they care is that they drop your balance to zero, right? So they violated the integrity of your bank account without actually violating the confidentiality of your bank account. Cool. So confidentiality, integrity, is there anything else we care about? Oh, Separation of privileges. Separation of privileges. Uh, I would say, how is that a security property? Because I suppose by getting different privileges, you can violate a, any of the other two properties. So right, so I would say separation of privileges is more of a way that you would, like a design principle of how to design a system such that it does these things. You could, I guess, technically design a system without any separation of privilege, if you are very, very careful. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good uh, additional defensive layer. Attack resilience. Was that? Attack, Attack resilience. So no one user should be able to hog all the resources of the system. What do you mean hog all the resources? Why uh, do you care about that? So for instance, if you are running a web server, mm -hmm. a single person opens multiple connections and you know, essentially drains all the TCP sockets on the chain. But why is that a security problem? Uh, it's more of an availability problem than a security problem. Well, is, is, that the same? is that different? No, it is I think so. Yeah. No. Service. Is that a security yeah. problem or not? Yeah, yeah. you can help all the stock exchange. It depends on the application. Right? Depends on the application in general, yes. So in general, availability is definitely considered like the third security component. Yeah. And the reason is kind of, if the system is not available, then it's not doing what it's supposed to do, right? So it might as well, I mean, for some systems, it might as well be useless, right? Um, so yeah, you can think about, actually a really good uh, attack I have to talk about on availability is, I've heard of stories, so you think about um, spam filters on emails, right, are pretty good, right? They do all this complicated detection across things to look at spam messages, uh, but there's a service out there on probably underground forums or whatever that will just send so you give it an email address and they'll just send random messages like messages with content that's complete gibberish but why would that be useful so will that get past spam filters yes yeah because there's there's no way to it's literally everything is random is it why is that a service why does that thing exist you cannot overload your mailbox what was that it overloads your mailbox. You can overload somebody's inbox. So I've heard of a story of hackers breaking into a bank. And what they did before they did it is, or right when they were going to do it, they used one of these services against the security team at the bank, filling up their inbox with garbage so that they wouldn't see the alerts that were coming in that they were setting off. Um, and so you can think of that as an attack on the availability of somebody's inbox, right? It's not that you're, you're not breaking into it, you're not deleting emails, but you're just filling it up with so much garbage that you, they can't actually get to the good information, uh, which I, I thought was very cool. Um, so I think of it, I re always remember it was CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Uh, you can add in kind of other ways to think about, and 
especially when you look at the history of like computer security, it came from a military background because they were the first people to start, you know, they care very much about confidential things. Uh, they don't really care about <coughs> privacy, right? They care about confidentiality, uh, making sure that sensitive and top secret whatever documents are kept that way. They also care about integrity. They make, make sure that the data is not modified or changed. Um, another way to think about that is in terms of consistency, the data is in a consistent state. Uh, also, availability is another big one. So this is kind of what you should be thinking about in your head when you're looking at the security of, of any kind of system. And these give you pretty broad, big goalposts to work towards, right? So like I mentioned, everything needs to consider the application that you're testing. But at the same time, if you can understand that, let's say, the confidentiality security policy of the application, if you find some way to violate that, that's a really cool uh, exploit. Um, so for instance, there is this crazy story. I wish I could find it about, uh, I think it I don't want to make up details, which is what I'm definitely going to do. But somebody, somebody found a bypass of the passcode page on like an iPhone. They found out that if you like open the, I think it was yeah, if you open the camera and then go back and then go right back and it's like really quickly do it, it would like just let you in sometimes. And so it's like a clear like confidentiality uh, breach, right? Because you don't want people who don't know your passcode to get access to your phone. Um, and so there was a clear case of that being not. Um, cool. I think like when the iPhone first came out, that was the that was the issue. You could get to the address book to make mm -hmm. a call. You could edit uh, contacts and add a URL. You click the URL and it opens a web browser, uh, and you can exploit WebKit. Interesting. So this is always a fun game to uh, if you go to like a hotel or something and you use their computers that have like a super lockdown, you know, version of Windows. It was always a fun game to play was to figure out how what you had to do to get to the real Windows because it's just running some applications. So you, sometimes it was just easy as like com, uh, Windows R for the run, and then you do CMD, and now you're on a, a prompt or I don't know. There's all kinds of fun ways through help files, same thing like help files to a link to somewhere, and yeah. Anyways, um, so yeah, yeah, all the, all that kind of stuff is you know those those bypasses of basically security mechanisms. Right, that are trying to gatekeep you. Or um, another one that I'll mention briefly that you can actually look up is Dropbox had this issue that somebody noticed, I think in 2011. No, it must have been before that. I don't remember. But where somebody was able to realize that you've probably done this before when you're logging into a website and you realize you typed in the wrong password, like right when you hit enter, so you know it's going to fail. Except they did this and it logged them in. And so they're like, uh, so they logged out, put in their email, put in a random password, and it logged them in. And so they told Dropbox immediately, and they had a fix within like a half hour or an hour. But it turned out somebody pushed some code that messed up the, the check, the password check. They were just not checking the password for whatever reason. <laughs> um, so Dropbox was actually really good because they, I mean, they have a whole blog post where you can read exactly what went wrong. I think they may have done like a snippet of the code too. And then they ran an analysis on everyone that logged in during that period and everyone who logged in during that period with the wrong password so they could identify the accounts that are actually affected. Um, so it's super interesting. Uh, but yeah, all this kind of, you know, these bugs, these security bugs can happen at any time and kind of whenever any code changes, right? Uh, and so, <laughs> so you can even have vulnerabilities. So we think, so we're going to use kind of the, the vulnerabilities term. Um, instead of security bugs, because that's more a little bit more technical. Uh, I guess I shouldn't speak for fish. I'm much more of an academic, so I like think you know. And you should. Uh, one of the things you should definitely do. My advice is to. So what's the difference between a vulnerability and an exploit? Yes. A vulnerability is a bug. An exploit is taking advantage of that vulnerability to do something. Yes, so it's exactly what we talked about with bugs and failures, right? The bug exists. The vulnerability exists in the code until it's triggered or until it's exploited, right? So the exploit is the actual act of using that vulnerability to get something, so, or to make the program do something it's not supposed to do. So this is something that, it's one of these pet peeves of mine, is people throw around the terms vulnerability and exploits when they mean the other thing. So just be in your mind very precise about what you're talking about and what you mean, and you'll make me happy in the future. Which shouldn't be your goal, but you'll make yourself happy. How about that? Cool. 
Okay, so so again, we kind of talked about this, touched on this a little bit. So vulnerabilities, they don't have to be unintended behavior, right? They could be in expected behavior in the sense of what we talked about of weak passwords, right? Or password default passwords. Um, this is something that's expected, right? It was created. Somebody, you think about every router, right? Somebody had to write that code to, that puts in the, that default username and password of admin admin. Right, that is expected behavior from their standpoint. And when you consider um, the use case, right, it actually, uh, when you consider the use case, it actually makes a lot of sense. Because you have end users, probably non-technical end users, that are gonna be setting up these wireless networks. Do you want them to have to, I don't know, read a sticker on the back that's this crazy random thing, or is it just an easy admin admin way in? Uh, you may even have, so what's an example of like conflicting security policies? Yeah. Maybe you're writing a client to server, and mm -hmm. uh, the client thinks that the client is trustworthy. I, I mean, and their own security policies is mapped, so um, server might send data that it thinks the client can protect, but the client thinks, oh, the server's gonna Yes, so actually, so like a great, there's a lot of good examples. Actually, the web is this way by default, right? So the web is you have a web application which is running some server side code. Every time you make a web, web request, that code generates um, HTML with JavaScript, and you can think about that <coughs> JavaScript code in your browser as client side code. So you have server and client there. So if the server is assuming that the client is doing certain checks, like making sure the input is not this length, it doesn't contain any characters and just blindly trusting that input, you can make any request to any web server at any time. Or uh, kind of another way to think about this that I just thought of, um, I used to do this as a kid, of the if mom and dad had different security policies, of can I have a glass of chocolate milk before bed, and mom would say no, so I'd go to dad, he'd say yes, and then I'd start drinking chocolate milk, and I'd get in trouble, be like, well, I don't understand, I asked, one, and then you learn which one to ask first, right? So you don't get into trouble. Um, yeah. Wasn't Shark Fleet an example? I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call Heart Fleet a conflicting security policy. But that was the server trust the client and the client thought that the server was validated? Uh, I mean, you could think of it in that way. I mean, it's a pretty common buffer overread, I would say, of trusting the client in terms of sending um, the length properly, but I think that occurs so many times in buffer overflows and all kinds of situations that uh, I don't think, I think this is more like what you were talking about, like clients and servers that trust that they're going to do something without realizing that somebody else can make that request. Or, um, yeah, so that's, that's a good example. Cool. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit, but now we're going to go deep because this is fun. So our, we talked about this. So are all software fault security bugs? No, some of them can be, right? So we talked about availability, right? If I had anybody ever seen this on like iPhone, and I'm sure that's something that exists for Android, where somebody would find a bug in the rendering engine for some font, and so if you sent somebody a text, or if they looked at a tweet, it would cause your phone to crash. Um, and these were like terrible until you like updated your operating system. Um, so you can think of that as an attack on availability. Right? Because if you can do this and, and send this to people, that could be an availability attack. Um, okay, so how can we be secure writing software? Write better tests. Write better tests. Does anybody write tests? Nice. How good are your tests? Do you know how good your tests are? All your tests packed. You need to have somebody else review it. You have somebody else review it. Follow best practices. Follow best practices. Try to break your own code. Try to break your own code, which can actually oftentimes be difficult, which may be why you need somebody else. Has anybody ever had this experience when you are staring at the bug in your code and you're like, I have no idea what the problem is, <laughs> and then somebody walks over and is like, Well, you're missing a semicolon right there. <laughs> Ah, how do I not see that? Yeah. What else? Automated test software. Say that again? Automated test software. Automated testing. So yeah, you can get pretty far and get some good. So all of these are kind of about uh, 
I would say increasing your assurance that the software is secure. But let's say you wanted, huh? Yeah, so you can try to manage risk by doing some kind of least privilege. You can separate your code into modules that each thing does a very small thing. Um, you can, I mean, they put like, so, you know software runs on airplanes mm -hmm. and on like things that land on the moon? Mm -hmm. So how do they do that? Very carefully. Very carefully. Actually, that is the truth, right? You, I mean, so they do all kinds of tests. They also write code. I think it's something like five lines, a, I think a day is slow or fast. It's like five lines a week or something. So you could do things like um, you just write it incredibly slow. You have it triple, quadruple reviewed. You can do things like have multiple teams develop the same things, like break your thing into components, have many different people write different components, like multiple copies of the same component and only use results when they all agree. Um, yeah? Abstract provers like Daphne? You could try to prove your code correct, which is incredibly difficult and still in its uh, infancy, I would say. Daphne makes you want to hit your head against someone. See, exactly. So, uh, and that's, so how, how much does it cost to write software in a way that it can run on a plane? Or run a plane, I guess I should say. A lot, yeah, I don't know, but it's a lot. You can look up the numbers. It's like, I don't know, tens or thousands of dollars per lines of code or something. I mean, they have, I actually can't remember off the top of my head the exact organization that certifies an organization to develop security critical code at various levels, which means they do all of these things that you're talking about. So let's say you do that and you write perfect code, perfect software. Is your thing secure? Depends on what it's running on top of. It depends on what it's, what it's running on top of, right? Why? Because that can have a vulnerability. Yeah, so you, we talked about operating system, right? The operating system is at the layer below all of your applications. So if I have a, an exploit against your operating system and now I can steal all your application's data, do you care that your code was bug free? Do your users care that your code was bug free? <laughs> No, they don't care, exactly. So, okay, I mean, we didn't talk about this, but people are going to use your software, right? So, anybody remember Windows 7? So Windows 7, for those that don't remember, was this really big Windows release after Windows XP. Windows XP had a really bad security posture by default. Vista. And so, oh, Vista. Oh, sorry, I'm taking it farther back. Vista, yeah, okay, historical oddity, great. Um, okay, so, Thank you for that. Uh, so Windows Vista, they said, okay, we're gonna completely, we're gonna have this crazy idea where users won't be the administrators on their computer by default, right? And who better to make the decision of whether to run a piece of software as an administrator than the user. Better than having Microsoft decide, right? Have the user decide. Uh, and so this touted as this revolutionary system that is gonna be amazing, it's gonna solve all these kind of security problems. And technically, it's very good. I mean, the, the stuff they had to do to make this work is probably insane. Um, so what happened when they released it? Too complicated for the users. Not too complicated for the users, I would say. They really like turned close. it off. They, I would say not even turned it off. So what happened? Encrypted ran everything. Yeah, they, caught, it's, uh, they call it like user fatigue or alert fatigue, where every time the user would try to run something, an alert box would pop up saying, this program wants to run as administrator. Do you want to do it? And of course they'd say yes because they're trying to do something. And they keep doing that over and over again. So when they download a piece of malware, malware.exe is trying to do some, run as administrator. Do you want to do this? Yes, they just click yes. <laughs> and so here you have actually technically very good security protection mechanisms, but you're not realizing that the users actually have, you know, these are human beings using your system and maybe the average computer user of Microsoft Windows can't make a security decision about whether something should run in, as an administrator or not. Um, so you need to have perfect users, right? Is that even enough? No, we just talked about that. You need to, so not only that, you need to configure the software perfectly, right? So this is actually a story that I tell when I was, I think probably my very first Linux server that I was adminning is one of these $5 a month things that I had to run a Ruby on Rails website I was creating. 
and I got to some bug or some problem that I didn't understand how to solve. And so I did a chmod 777-capital mm -hmm. R on slash. Which for those that don't live and breathe Unix commands, I set the permissions of every single file on that thing to readable, writable, and executable by every user on the system. And let me tell you, my problem went away. <laughs> Everything just worked. Like the thing that was not working worked. And then I, and then I logged off. Um, everything was working and I tried to log back on and it told me I couldn't log on because my key was uh, no longer valid because my SSH authorized key file was world writable. And so then I had to make a ticket with support and the poor person there was like, uh, your permissions are all weird. It's, I think what they nicely said. And so they fixed it for me so I could get back in. But yeah, that was a good lesson of like, so your software can be super secure, but if an admin ch mods everything is 777, then you're going to be insecure, right? Because the configuration, how your software is actually deployed, really makes an impact on the security. Um, so yeah, to actually do this, right, you need to be able to write perfect software, have perfect users, configure the software perfectly, have a perfect operating system that we talked about. And maybe even down to now we're having problems in CPUs, right? Of having um, with Spectre and Meltdown of having, is that where we get to that? I don't remember. Um, having, or what, say that again? And memory. Yeah, and row hammer attacks, which basically uh, allow a unprivileged user to flip bits by, so apparently, I mean, it's not apparently, it makes sense, right? Uh, all of the, you think it when you really boil it down to like a hardware memory stick, right? It's just a series of electrical things that keep a charge of one or zero. And it turns out if you, I think it's read and write a line really quickly, two lines or flip it or something. Oh, that's right. But if you, was it write the two lines above it? I don't remember all the details, but uh, if you mess with two of the, the lines above it, you can actually cause some bits to flip in the middle line on something that you weren't even touching or manipulating. Um, which is insane. So that's like road hammer. So uh, yeah, you would need to go all the way down and write hardware that from the ground up had was completely perfect. So the idea of this exercise is to show that it's essentially impossible. Like I don't think we will ever get there. Um, so we, yeah. You can also use a Van Eck antenna. A what? A Van Eck antenna. Yes, so then you'd have side channel attacks through basically electromagnetic uh, radio, I mean, uh, stuff. So yeah, all kinds of stuff. I mean, they have, there's a paper on how to extract um, SS, you know, Price. encryption keys via the fan noise. Because the fan noise is a side channel to the power usage of the CPU, which is highly correlated with what operations are being run. Oh, isn't there also uh, one about keystrokes from Wi-Fi? Oh, there's all, keys, keystrokes are a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to get keystrokes of, uh, you know, even your phone here on the table, you typing here, the gyroscope, figuring out the vibrations to map that to your keystrokes. Um, all kinds of crazy, nothing is secure. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, so then, you know, even that's not, you need, so now you need to be running a perfect hypervisor. We are talking about firmware, right? So, I know that there's something that runs first on your computer, right? When you turn your computer on, there's a little piece of the BIOS that actually runs. How do you know there's not a backdoor in there that's selling all of your data to you? Yeah. I don't remember if it was Lenovo, but someone used this to bypass HTTPS. Probably, I would not be surprised. So that they could put their own ads in people's pages? That's crazy. I would, I would, I would not doubt it, was it? I don't want to call anybody out right now, but sure. Always, yes. Always go with the cool. Okay. And so it turns out that not, so this would be the perfect world. And it turns out the real world is even easier. You don't have perfect software even to begin with. <laughs> so often, so does anybody work for the company? Oh, nice. Wow. A lot of everyone. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you may or may not be aware that uh, everything doesn't always go according to plan they may not actually be deploying any effective security protections. Um, the administrators may not be, even be applying patches for known vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, sites don't monitor or restrict access internally, so as soon as you compromise one of the, let's say, developer machines, 
well, developer engineering is pretty powerful, but let's say somebody in a different organization, um, human resources, now you can get access to the Git server and get all their source code. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, the real world is definitely um, very crazy. And so this is not only all of this, but so Spectre and Meltdown, have, have people heard of this? So if you've taken a computer uh, architecture course, you know and understand that CPUs will oftentimes, so when there's a branch instruction, right, fundamentally the CPU does not know which branch is gonna be taken. So it would have to wait until that current instruction is done executing to decide what to execute next. Modern CPUs use a series of pipelines where they're doing little pieces of each instruction at a time so they can do things very quickly. So what do they do to solve this problem of not knowing where branches go? Branch prediction. Yeah, so they try to predict which branch will be taken. So they actually have some dedicated piece of hardware that does that. And then, depending on which one they think is going to happen, they will speculatively start executing that right behind the other instruction. And then, if the original, if their guess was wrong, then they flush that instruction, get rid of it, so it's like it never happened. Which is how CPUs do work, should work. The problem that people found out is those speculative instructions actually start messing with the cache. So you can start inferring information by using the cache to figure out speculatively what would have happened, it's a whole thing. Uh, you should read these, uh, these uh, write-ups on Spectre and Meltdown because even the hardware is getting crazy, yeah. Wasn't the problem not that it was messing with the cache but that it was um, visible to the user? But I guess the question is how it, I, 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 like if I recall it was, it was visible through a timing side channel so using the cache. But yeah, it, and there's very, multiple variants, and I honestly haven't kept up with all of them, but they're all crazy. There's, there's even like a net, out. I believe there's a net specter or net. One of these has a net prefix now where you can do it over the network, oh. do this kind of timing thing. The ones just came out. Huh? Yeah, new specter bugs came out. Yeah, see, it's all kinds of, everything's messed up. Like the CPU itself, you can't even trust anymore. Cool, okay, so. We talked about this, so I'm not gonna, I wanna get to the actual uh, course stuff. So how to develop secure software, we talked about a little bit. There are a lot of different types of ways to get there of increase, you know, you will never, I mean, you'll never be able to do perfect software, right? But the goal is, well, it's very easy to do really crappy, very insecure software. And so the idea is using kind of some of the best practices we talked about, testing, peer review, um, pen testing, uh, internal test, like uh, internal pen testing, blue team review, red team review, like these are all good ways to increase your assurance that there are no security problems in your code. <coughs> okay, what time do we have? 55 or 50? 50. 50. 50. I think that's what you think, uh, what you're just trying to tell me. Okay, so we're gonna go through this quickly. Okay, so you will be able to, basically the idea of this, of this course is you're gonna be thinking about analyzing systems and are they designed security, are they implemented security, are they deployed and configured securely? Um, and this, so a security analyst, it's essentially difficult to automate because it requires world knowledge, right? You have to, like we've talked about, you need to understand what the system is supposed to do, the intended behavior, so you can detect the unintended behavior. Um, you, and this is kind of, it also requires this testing mindset, which you definitely need to start developing, of thinking, okay, how can I break this, and what would it do if I did that thing? And then, and you also kind of, I, I think of it as thinking in terms of a scientist, right? You have some hypothesis, if I do X, then the system should break and give me access. So you do X, it didn't give you access, now what? What part of your hypothesis was broken that you can rethink to try a new approach? Um, and this is really just what it is. You're just continually going through that. Um, okay, so for this course, the goal is you will learn to identify design, implementation vulnerabilities in systems, network protocols, and application at all those levels. Um, you'll learn about protection detection mechanisms and techniques. 
and you will absolutely be learning by example, so vulnerabilities and how to exploit them. Uh, Fish says the devil is in the details. My philosophy is you don't actually know how security works until you put your fingers to the keyboard and actually do it. So I can stand up here, Fish can stand up here, teach you about buffer overflows until you're blue in the face, until you understand buffer overflows, and then we take you to a computer and say, okay, exploit this program. Then you realize it's much more difficult than it is in theory. So figuring everything out, and then when you actually get it working, it's one of the best feelings in the world. It's awesome. Uh, so I'm very excited for you, you all. So you will be <coughs> learning what cyber hackers do in real life. Infiltration, stealing valuable information, achieving persistence. These are all things you're going to be learning in this class. And learning by practice by playing against each other in Capture the Flag events how to combat cyber hackers. So looking at traffic, auditing systems, understanding the state of things. Um, so you will, the skills you're gonna learn are ability to understand and assess the security implications of network systems. They're all terrible, that's a hint. Um, the ability, you'll be able to, after you leave this course, perform a security analysis of a system. So essentially uh, teaching you how to pen test a system and to understand that. Uh, to understand and contribute to research on the topic. Uh, this is an outline of the course. I'm not gonna go into this. There was stuff that Fish definitely wanted me to cover, so let me do this. Um, this is all gonna be super cool stuff. Um, uh, cool things are, you're gonna be a real hacker. So all of you have it in you. Hacking is not about like lead speak or I don't know, pretending to be cool or something <laughs> or pretending deliberately to not be cool, like the opposite. Um, being a hacker is all about knowledge and understanding how a system works and how to make it do something it's not supposed to do. So it's based on knowledge. You're all smart people. You can, with hard work, you will be able to learn that knowledge. Uh, so you, there'll be eight in-class competitions as well as a final competition. You'll work in teams of up to four to five. Um, you'll have to prepare for each competition in advance. Um, Fish is gonna release the services beforehand so you can actually work on it beforehand. And then afterwards, analyze your performance and do some self-assessment to understand how you did and how you can get better um, for the next competition. So some important things <coughs> that Fish wanted me to mention. Okay, requirements. You will need very good programming skills. So this actually goes into what Fish wants me to say. Uh, C++, Python. So basically, you need good C or C++ skills because a lot of the binaries are written in C or C++. You need to understand, read it, write it. Um, Python or a scripting language, Python is a very good one. Uh, you need to be familiar with bash, kind of shell scripting. You need to have good understanding of OS basic operating system concepts, process, file system, memory management, basic networking knowledge. Um, and I will say from Fish that this is, it's not a hard class, but the workload will be heavy. So take that as you will. Uh, if you're not ready for a heavy class, so heavy class means, I mean, it's gonna involve work, right? There's, time and effort in this course. Not hard in the sense that you will, um, it's not like an impossible course, I don't know, we're not, it depends on your background, I guess, and your personality, like we're not gonna be proving P is equal to NP or anything like that, hard. Um, everything is doable, but it requires effort. I think that's, that's the key here. Uh, so if you're, and this is the same way I run 545 too. So I get about 40 students out of 130, no, 100, I think I went from 170 to 130 uh, so if you're not ready for a heavy class, drop it. This is not an easy get an A course to show up. Uh, you know, this is a hardcore, I mean, not hardcore, but it's a intensive, hands-on course. So if you're willing to put in the time and the effort, I think everyone here can do that and get an A, um, but don't expect an easy workload. Um, okay, so... Let's go really quickly. Uh, the grades are not curved, is what he wants you to mention. Um, so there will be no curving. He'll have a grading scale up that you'll be able to easily see. Here's the grading breakdown. I'll let you look at that later. It's mainly you know, uh, homeworks, which are projects on your own, midterm, final, in-class hacking competitions as a group, and the hacking final. Uh, miscellaneous, so the class, so the course is all gonna be run on Piazza. Uh, please feel free, ask questions online, in class, make appointment, go to office hours. Uh, Fish really believes that, um, that uh, you, you know,
part of being a good hacker is going out and learning new things. So uh, proact being proactive and going after, you know, taking advantage of the resources that you have in terms of fish. Don't ask me any questions after fish starts talking. I like you all, but I have my own class to teach this semester. Thank you. Um, the TA is Mosin. Mosin, stand up, wave. Hi, I'm TA. So most you'll get to know him really well. Um, let's see. Okay, very quickly, I'm not sure if this is actually permitted in this room. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Oh, yeah, he wants no phones and no laptops uh, during the lectures, FYI, and he is told me to say seriously, no phones or laptops during lectures. Um, obviously not the CTFs. You will know well in advance when those will be, so don't freak out. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, the other important things are logistically, and we'll probably figure this out as we get a little closer. Um, okay, any questions on that first? I know we're over time. I appreciate your guys' patience so I can finish this. I think we had some good discussions. Okay, yes? Is his curriculum going to be the same as the curriculum that you usually use? Sorry. I don't know how to answer that. I think the answer is, well... <coughs> The way I think I'll phrase that is every professor teaches a class in their own way. So, um, and he's not me. Yeah. Yes. Do you know what the homework will be? Do not. <coughs> Do not. Yes. Yes. Is there a book for the course? Their book? I think no. There'll be a syllabus up very soon. Um, he's actually, I think he's traveling to DC right now for a um, grant, end of a grant thing. A um, couple questions, though that you can come up and talk to me. So for the CTFs, you will need your own laptop, so everyone will need a laptop to use. Uh, if you don't have one, please talk to me so we can, or talk to me so I can let Fish know so we can figure something out. We'll definitely make sure that that happens. Um, there you go. Awesome, it'll be a fun semester. <laughs>